One more slip up, one more mistake, and this fraternity of yours has had it at favor. <laughs> That was pleasant. Nice of him to stop by, don't you think? We've got to do something. He's serious this time. I think he knows about the exams. He's right. You're right. We got to do something. Absolutely. You know what we got to do? Toga, toga party. party. We run double secret probation, whatever that is. We can't afford to have a toga party. You guys up for a toga party? Toga! Toga! You know, uh, last week, uh, Chris, we finished our series on community. Remember that? And Chris made that cool like sign down here with nails and string, remember? Uh, this Wednesday as staff, he said, so Peter, um, what's your like theme for Romans? Because it'd be cool to have like, you know, a theme for, for, the whole, for the whole thing, like a visual, a visual that could be up on stage that people would look at. So, how's this, how's this, yeah. Yeah, well, okay, so there's, that's a good point. It feels like we've been on double secret probation since like last, a year and a half ago, March, right? Since 2020. So how about this year, every Sunday, when you come to church, you wear a toga. As, as we exposit St. Paul's epistle to the Romans. Yeah, what do you think of that toga? Toga, 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 toga. E Emma, you're not, you're not, are you not feeling this? You're not feeling this? You think it's, you think it's inappropriate, maybe? I, you love me, I know. Okay, well, let's, let's pray. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, we do ask that you would help us to preach. Lord God, you know that I'm really excited after all these years <laughs> to be preaching through, through Romans, and yet, God, it scares me. Because I feel like I cannot do it justice. And uh, so, Lord God, I'm asking that you would do it justice, that do, you would do your, yourself justice. <laughs> Thank you that you are. And I do pray that you would help us to preach and maybe also find a theme. Amen. All right, Romans, Romans chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 1. Paul, uh, a servant or a slave of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, that means one who's sent, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That was one sentence. I mean, Paul starts talking about Jesus and he gets so excited, he's like a freshman at his first toga party can't shut up. Just saying. It's one sentence, and it's a greeting at the start of the epistle of Romans. Epistle means letter, just a fancy word for letter, and maybe that should be our theme. The letter. Got me a ticket for an aeroplane. Ain't got time to take a slow, fast train. Only days are gone, I'm a going home. My baby, she wrote me a letter. Yeah. Sometimes people say things like, why should I care about a letter, an ancient letter? I care about taking action. I want to make a difference in the world. I hear you. I sympathize with that. But isn't an 
Interesting how a letter can change everything and make you do almost anything. I don't care how much money I got to spend. Got to get back to my baby again. Lonely days are gone. I'm a going home. My baby just wrote me a letter. I have a sack of letters tied with a ribbon that I keep in a special place in my office. Letters from my girlfriend when I was in college. Because of those letters, I vowed myself to her in an unconditional, legally binding, lifelong contract, and I did it with a smile on my face. And I've given her all the money, all the money that I've ever made. Because I wanted to. I have a letter from my dad that I keep in the back of my old Bible. I think God has used it time and time again to keep me from sinking into an absolute pit of despair. I can't think of any legislation, government, school, or thought, or program. There's this much to change the world as a letter. In specific, Paul's letter to the Romans. But it is a letter. If your beloved wrote to you a letter and for some reason wrote it in a different language, wouldn't you try to learn the language? And if someone said to you, hey, you really love languages, you, you really care about grammar and all that stuff, you'd say, no, I actually don't give a turd about English, Greek, or Latin. I want to read the letter. Because maybe, lonely days are gone, I'm a going home, my baby just wrote me a letter. You'd learn to read the letter. But as Soren Kierkegaard points out, you certainly wouldn't want to read a bunch of commentaries about that letter. Kill the commentators, wrote Soren Kierkegaard. And in a way, I'm kind of a commentator right now. And so I hope you don't kill me. But I do hope that I can help you learn to read the letter so you would not simply read commentators because the commentators don't love you. And who is better to understand the meaning of a letter than the beloved to whom the letter is written? Grace and peace to you from God our Father, our Dad, writes Paul. Romans is a letter written to you, but through a Hebrew rabbi writing in Greek to your brothers and sisters in first century Rome. And so to understand the words, we'll need to address some language issues like syntax, grammar, and translation. And to get to know the, to get the meaning, it'll be helpful to know a little bit more about the writer and the original recipients. We'll talk about this as we go along. But the writer is a rather infamous Pharisee, a brilliant religious scholar, with a profile much like that of someone that we would now describe as a terrorist but a terrorist that has undergone such a radical and amazing transformation that people like the Roman governor Festus think he's gone mad, lost his psyche. The original recipients were Romans in Rome, Romans that look remarkably similar to us modern Americans. It appears that Paul is writing from Corinth in Greece, along about 55 AD, toward the end of his third missionary journey, as he prepares to travel to Jerusalem with an offering to help the poor people in Jerusalem, as is recorded in the book of Acts, along about chapter 20. He then plans to go to Spain and stop on his way to Spain in Rome to encourage the Romans and be encouraged by the Romans and hopefully get some support. Paul had never been to Rome. And no one really knows how the church in Rome got started, especially at such an early date, 55. That's only like 20 years after the resurrection. No one knows how it started, but Paul is aware of controversies in that church and throughout the empire, controversies then and there, just like those here and now. So, in, in the church in Rome, there are legalists and conservatives who appear to be concerned that Paul's gospel will cause people to sin thinking that grace may abound. And there are libertines, liberals, and progressives who think that maybe there is no such thing as sin, and so they ought to just, you know, flaunt their freedom. And there are holy rollers flaunting their spiritual gifts and thinking that they're better than the others. So the epistle to the Romans is relevant to us, and yet we will have to work at it a bit. There are no punctuation marks 
in ancient Greece or Greek, so, so it can be a challenge to know when Paul is asking a question or presenting the other side of an argument, like from the libertine conservatives or holy rollers, and I'm pretty sure Paul would be mortified. He'd be mortified to discover that there are actually people who have never actually read his letter, but they think they've understood his letter because of two or three lines cross-stitched onto a pillow at a Bible bookstore. I'm just saying, Paul expects more of us than that. More than any other book of the Bible, Romans is a unified, systematic, theological explanation of what Paul calls the gospel. That means that Paul may create a crisis in chapter one. Did you just hear me? He may create a crisis in chapter one that he does not resolve until chapter 11. And when he gets to chapter 11, he wants you to remember chapter one. And along the way, I think he wants us all to wrestle. So I'll try to connect dots as we go along, but I'm asking you to commit to be consistent, to commit to be consistent, to put some brain power into this project and to wrestle, but not just to wrestle with, with human words and ideas and philosophies, but to wrestle with Jesus. Not just the written word, but the living word, to wrestle with Jesus who is already implanted in your heart as a seed, an eternal seed. About 20 years before this letter to the Romans was written, and just a couple years after Jesus was crucified, Saul of Tarsus, whom we now call Paul, that's his Latin name, Saul of Tarsus was traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus with orders from the high priest to arrest followers of Jesus, bind them, and deliver them up for persecution and, and even death. Rabbi Saul had studied at the feet of the great Rabbi Gamaliel in Jerusalem, but now he even surpassed Gamaliel in his rabid devotion to pleasing God by obeying his every command. He was a Pharisee and a Pharisee of Pharisees. The Pharisees sought to make explicit uh, the commands of the Old Testament that were already explicit. They sought to make them even more explicit and practical so that everyone would, could, and should do them. That is, do the good. Well, frantically seeking to do the good, Paul was suddenly confronted by the one who is the good. A brilliant, a brilliant light appeared to him on the road to Damascus, blinding him, knocking him on his can, and speaking, saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then I am sending you to be a witness to the things in which you've seen me and those in which I will be seen by you. And as we will see, Paul sees Jesus everywhere. (laughs) He sees him everywhere, including the words of the Old Testament, such that when David speaks in the Psalms, Paul doesn't just hear David then. He hears Jesus now and then. So for Paul, the Word of God was recorded in a book, but the Word of God is also actually alive and more than willing to show up on the road and just wrestle you to the ground. Just like the Word wrestled Jacob at the edge of the Promised Land and named him Israel. Israel, which means the one who wrestles with God. Paul thinks you are Israel. I'm asking you to read Romans. This is what I'm asking you. What is Peter saying? I'm asking you to read Romans and to wrestle with him, the Word of God. About 40 years ago, when I was in college and desperately trying to be good, so good that I'd be gooder than all my neighbors, So good that I'd be first and they'd be last. So good that I would be the best, which would make them the least and the last. In college, I went to this large Bible study where the leader challenged all of us to to, to memorize Romans chapter 8, and I did. The only lengthy chapter of the Bible that I've ever memorized. I mean, I think I knocked off a psalm, you know, the one that has like three verses or whatever, but that didn't really count. But Romans 8, I memorized At the time, I figured that I had the gospel down, but for 40 years now, the living word has wrestled me. The living word has wrestled me with that written word, Romans chapter eight. 
At times, I've thought I would die, and I think I did die. But the word that killed me also raised me from the dead. I'm saying the letter, the letter isn't just a letter, but a living word that conquers all things. So how this, how's this for a theme? The letter that conquered Rome. That's a pretty good theme. The letter to the Romans was hugely influential in the early church. The early church fathers uh, were very influenced by the letter, and ironically, they were all uh, persecuted by the empire of Rome. Under the influence of Origen, most believed that the letter clearly taught that all humanity had been subjected to futility, consigned to disobedience by God in order that God might have mercy on all, such that one day every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, that everyone might have faith. In 386 AD, a young man named Augustine, or Augustine, threw himself down under a fig tree in a garden near Rome. He was weeping in agony that he couldn't seem to make himself good because indeed God seemed just impossible to please. Later he would write that it was then and it was there that he heard the voice of a child saying, pick up and read. And at that he opened Romans. His eyes fell on this verse, Romans 13, 13, not in riots and drunken parties, not in strife and rivalry, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. At once, he writes in his confessions, a light of relief from all anxiety flooded my heart. Augustine saw that the good was not something that he could do, but was someone that could do him. And he could like put the good on, put him on. Grace through faith and this not of himself was revealed to Augustine in the miraculous voice of a child and the book of, of Romans. Augustine was the first great Roman theologian. But before long, he would begin arguing, unlike Origen and against Origen, he would begin arguing that grace was only for some. Those that were to be received into the brand new Roman Catholic Church under the direction of the newly Christianized Roman Empire, emperor, emperor. Eventually, the Roman Catholic Church made it impossible for most people to even read Paul's epistles to the Romans. Or even in any scripture, unless they were authorized representatives of the Roman Catholic Church, a priest. So maybe this could be our theme. <laughs> The letter that conquered Rome and how Rome tried to conquer the letter. A thousand years later, 1515, a Roman Catholic priest charged with teaching seminarians the meaning of Paul's epistle to the Romans sat agonizing, just agonizing in the Wittenberg Tower in Germany. God seemed to be so incredibly hard to please and he could not comprehend Romans 1, 17, which he was supposed to teach. The good news, supposedly, supposedly good news, that the righteous shall live by faith or from faith or even from God's faithfulness as some translate the verse. Martin Luther wrote, night and day I pondered until I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness whereby through grace and sheer mercy he justifies us. That means makes us right by faith. Faith. Thereupon I felt myself reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. Luther taught that this faith was not his choice, but God's choice, God's gracious choice in him, and he postulated that God might actually, could do, he might actually do this with everyone. But soon, soon, Luther had to ally himself with princes in the Holy Roman Empire. And one of his followers, John Calvin, basically tried to establish a new empire in Switzerland where some were judged out uh, because others were judged in. And before long, the children of the Reformation began talking as if faith were a work of the flesh that people could just decide to choose to do and then be proud that they had chosen. And so by 1980, Peter Hyatt would sit in his dorm room at the University of Colorado desperately trying to move mountains with faith. 
seriously. And then desperately trying to make a car horn honk with faith. Or at least prove that he was better at faith than his neighbors. In other words, he could be very ungracious about faith. And God just seemed impossibly hard to please. (laughs) And often he still does. In the last hundred years, the letter to the Romans has shaken things up once again, most notably through the Swiss pastor named Karl Barth and his commentary on Romans. Scholars claim that Karl Barth rescued the church from liberalism, for Barth wasn't concerned with people's thoughts about God, but rather God's thoughts about people. He rescued the church from liberalism, but then conservatives were deeply offended by Barth, for Barth claimed that God's thoughts about people In other words, his judgment of every person was Jesus. Most recently, Douglas Campbell, Duke University, professor of theology, published a commentary that appears to be rocking the theological world once again because he agrees with Origen and Athanasius and Bart that God freely chooses to create faith by grace in all his children. This is Karl Barth's commentary, which I highly recommend, though it's, it is challenging to read, translated from German. Uh, this is Douglas Campbell's uh, commentary. Just got it in the mail. The thing is so stinking fat. I think it's so, f- what's that? I'm not chewing on this whole thing on Tuesday, Nick, because it's too fat, all right? So just don't get your expectations up. But I think it's so fat That's right, Brandy's holding Nick's arm saying, calm down, Nick. Um, I think it's so fat, not because Romans is so complex, but because the lies that we swim in every day are so complex. And so hopefully the commentaries can help us undo some of those lies. Hopefully they can help us deal with uh, the language issues. But mostly, I want you to read the letter. Read the letter. Read the written word, written word and, and I want you to call on the living word, Jesus. And be aware, be aware that the principalities and powers of this world do not like Jesus. The name means God is salvation. And the principalities and powers of this world, they want you to believe that we humans and our institutions are salvation. You see, I think that Rome, and by that I mean the institutions of this world, the principalities and powers, I think that Rome is still trying to conquer the letter. And so the institutional church has sanctioned confusing theological words like judgment, righteousness, justification, and faith. But when Paul wrote the letter, he wrote in the Greek vernacular to new converts. They didn't hear theological words sanctioned by institutions. They heard understandable words that everyone knew, like like decision. You all know what that word means, right? I think they heard decision rather than judgment. I think they heard right rather than righteousness. I mean, you all talk about what's right, right? And I think they heard make right rather than justification. And I think they heard trust rather than than faith. And when they read the letter, there were no divisions in the text. Chapter and verse were added 1,500 years later by the institutional church. That means the Romans didn't just read Romans 3, 23, for instance. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They read 23 and 24 together. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified, made right, by his grace as a gift. Who? All that have sinned and fallen short of the glory of of God. So when you read, be cautious around theological words. Remember there are no divisions between chapters and verses and be cautious of common sense. Common sense is how we do things in this world in which we believe that we save ourselves. But the word of God is literally how God saves us. He is the beginning and the end and the way from one to the other. Without him, you are lost. Apollolos. Some call that hell. Hell. 
The end is Jesus. God is salvation rather than we are salvation. And so Rome and the institutions of this world cannot win in the end. So how's this for a theme? Take the Romans' road all the way to the end. Now, if you grew up in the evangelical world, you have undoubtedly come across this uh, pamphlet called The Romans' Road, right? Uh, Romans Road, these five stops on the Romans Road. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Romans 5.8, Christ died for us, which is actually looping back a little bit on the road if you pay attention. Romans 10.9, if you confess and believe, you will be saved. Romans 10.13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's all true. But then they say you must make this choice. You must make this choice. Cold faith manifests in good works before your body dies. You, pay attention, must choose to call upon the name of the Lord, which is Yeshua, God is salvation, or God will not be salvation, which means God will no longer be Jesus. But some sort of vindictive monster who will torture you without mercy forever without end, that is without Jesus who is the end. And that's not true. And that is exactly what stressed out Augustine in 386, Martin Luther in 1515, and me in 1980 as I sat in my dorm room desperately trying to have faith, and Saul of Tarsus before God saved him from himself. The terrorist. Well, they call that the Romans Road. Last stop was Romans 10. But Romans has 16 chapters. And some people think 16 was added, added later, which we'll talk about. It's a bunch of greetings. But Paul really wraps things up in chapter 14. So we ought to take it all the way to the end. And who's the end? Jesus, at least until the end, who is Jesus, and we ought to take the letter of Romans at least to chapter 11 and 14. So at the start of Romans, you'll see this, Paul creates all sorts of ethical dilemmas that leave us all condemned. And then in Romans 3 through 11, he makes a long historical theological argument encompassing Adam, uh, Israel, Rome, and us, and, and, and at the end of 11, he makes clear what he said several different ways already. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. And then Paul introduces a whole new type of ethic a whole new type of ethic, and describes what it looks like to live believing the good news that is the gospel. In chapter 14, he quotes Isaiah, as I live, says the Lord. In other words, God is swearing. As I live, says Yahweh, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise. Every tongue shall confess. He says it, and Paul quotes it in two different places, and you can read it in Isaiah. That means every heart attached to every knee will one day have faith, give praise, and be saved, just as Isaiah had prophesied hundreds of years before. God is salvation. In other words, Jesus, that's the good news, that's the gospel. Dang. When Luther glimpsed the gospel, the gospel in Romans, he said everything changed. In 1958, the famous psychohistorian Eric Fromm published a book in which he conjectured that Luther must have been constipated and sitting on the toilet in the Wittenberg Tower while reading Romans. When he had such a powerful anal release that it transformed the way he viewed his earthly father and his father in heaven and gave birth to the Reformation. In college, at the University of Colorado, I wrote a paper on Eric Erickson and Luther, making the argument that all seminarians should do their studies while seated on toilets. You see, the world can't understand the transformation, and so tries to explain the transformation with toilets and prunes. But it was the gospel. The word of God really does set us free to live in a new way. No longer full of crap. 
So how's this for a theme? The divine laxative. Yeah, I know. I think Paul would probably prefer this one, the next one. The gospel according to Paul. The gospel is not a bargain or a threat. It's an announcement so powerful that it can actually make you lose your psyche and find it. Paul claims that this gospel is the good news that all the prophets prophesied, uh, but uh, no one had had the courage to believe. He calls it the gospel of God. So if you think God and Jesus are battling each other, you got it wrong. It's the gospel of God and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He thinks it is the message of his letter. So Romans, Romans is perhaps the first complete gospel that was ever written. We know for a fact it was written before the gospel of Luke, who was Paul's traveling companion and recorded their travels in the book of Acts. Romans was almost certainly written before John and probably before Mark and Matthew. So when Paul describes Jesus, he's not describing a different Jesus. All that crap you hear about Jesus of Paul, that's just bunk, it's ridiculous. He's revealing the same Jesus that always was, is, ever shall be, and when Luke, John, Mark, and Matthew wrote their gospels, the theology of Paul in the letter to the Romans was ringing in their ears. Romans 1. One through seven, let's just read it again. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, that's what the word means. Called to be an apostle. This isn't Paul's choice, it's God's choice. Set apart for the gospel, the good news of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David, literally um, made from the seed, the sperm of David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. For the sake of his name, Yeshua, God of salvation, among all the peoples, all the nations, including you, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Not only is Paul called, but he's talking like anybody who reads his letter in all the nations is called by God our Father. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is chosen to preach the good news to bring about the obedience of faith. The good news is not dependent on the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith is dependent on the good news, who is the word of our Father. So what, so what is then the, the obedience of faith? On vacation, Susan and I visited our son Coleman. He's uh, working on a PhD fellowship at Utah State in geotectonics. His wife Natalie is also working on a PhD in geomorphology. It amazes me because we used to worry that Coleman might not make it through high school. And because when Coleman was in junior high and we would go hiking, he would just tease me incessantly about my love for geology. Look at that, a rock. <laughs> geology, which was my field of study, which was my undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado. Coleman, Coleman while we were on vacation, he took us around Utah State and he showed us the the just insanely high-tech equipment that he was working on, equipment like the mass spectrometer that he uses to analyze helium isotopes from water samples that he collects in Peru. And he showed me pictures of the mass spectrometer he works on down at the Federal Center, you know, just off 6th Avenue, uh, when the school flies him home to use that equipment because it's equipment just too stinking expensive for a university. And I think to myself, dang, it seems like only yesterday, Coleman, that I was afraid to let you drive my truck. <laughs> well, imagine if I knew everything. I don't, but imagine if I did, like God, because he's outside of time, he, he knows everything. Imagine if I knew everything, but maybe, uh, like God, but maybe I, I wasn't God. And imagine if I appeared to Coleman when he was just five years old. And I said, Coleman, stop playing Pokemon. I have something important to tell you. You will graduate from high school and obtain a bachelor's degree in geology, 
from the university of college in the image and likeness of me, your father. And yea, even greater things than these will you do. You do. You will obtain a full right PhD fellowship, marry someone that looks like mom, who is also working on a full right PhD fellowship, and you will fly to Peru, obtain water samples, analyze them for healing my steps in the mass spectrometer at the Federal Center just off of Sixth Avenue. Now get cracking. For if you do not obey, it means I am not your father. Well, that might create significant anxiety for a five-year-old Coleman. He might become rather constipated emotionally. In his heart, he would be trapped in hell, even if he was surrounded by heaven, for he would think his father was just impossible to please. Recently, I felt like God has been asking me, Peter, do you think I'm hard to please? I never said those things to Coleman when he was five, but I'm pretty sure the devil's been whispering those things to me and to you ever since we were five. He's a terrorist who would like to make you obedient in abject fear. For then you see you could never be obedient at all. Well, I never said that to Coleman when he was five, but every Monday when he was five, and at least the weather was night, we would we'd take a bike ride. I would ride my bike, and he would ride this cool back bike trailer we got from the rinkies that attached to the posts on my bike. He could pedal, but usually he couldn't pedal fast enough to add any real momentum uh, to uh, to the two of us as we'd fly together down the bike path 20 miles, about 20 miles from Morrison to downtown Denver where we would split a place, a plate of nachos at the Rock Bottom Brewery on 16th Avenue. I mean, it was a party. It was a real party. Except for one afternoon. We were making our way back, gaining an elevation. Coleman had been quiet for a while. I stopped for a break. We both got off our bike, and Coleman said, Daddy, I have something to tell you. He seemed terribly concerned. I said, well, okay, buddy. What is it? He said, Daddy? Daddy? Yeah, what is it? Dad, Daddy? Daddy, um, you know, uh, there was a place on that hill back there, Daddy. And they put his head down. There was a place on that hill back there, Daddy, where I wasn't pedaling. I, 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 re I remember... Um, I almost laughed out loud and just exclaimed, Coleman, I don't need you to pedal. But then I realized that he wanted to pedal, just like I was pedaling. So I said something like, oh, buddy, no worries, no worries. That's okay, that's okay. But thanks for pedaling. Immediately, he brightened up and we pedaled. He, he pedaled. I, I didn't have to look. I knew he was pedaling. He pedaled all the way home and through junior high, even as he made fun of me for my love for geology, and through high school, graduated from high school with a few terrifying detours along the way, graduated from the University of Colorado with a degree in geology, married a girl that even looked like mom, received a PhD fellowship and worked on the mass spectrometer on 6th Avenue, not because he had to, but because he wanted to. That's the obedience of faith. Romans 8, 15, Paul writes, when we cry Abba, Abba is an Aramaic word that scholars are pretty, sure, they know what it means, but they're scared to translate it. It means daddy or maybe, or maybe dad, Abba, dada. Paul writes, when we cry daddy, father, it is the spirit himself. 
what spirit? The spirit of Jesus, bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God and of children, and heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs of Christ, provided that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. In Galatians, he writes, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, saying, Abba, Daddy, is faith. And faith always wants to peddle in the image and likeness of God, our Father. How is it the five-year-old Coleman could ever become who he actually is? Only by peddling in faith, faith that I was his and he is always mine. How could you ever become the image and likeness of God? Only by faith that comes from the word of your father, your dad. You know, when Coleman was an infant, like with all of my children, I remember holding him in my arms and speaking a word into that little bundle of flesh. Abba, Dada, say Dada, say Daddy, say Daddy, say Daddy. The epistle to the Romans means that you can say Daddy, just like Coleman said Daddy just like Jesus said, Daddy. Just like the terrorist Rabbi Saul of Tarsus said, Daddy. And here's a little secret. I really don't give a shit whether or not Coleman gets a PhD in geotectonics from Utah State University. But I think, I think, I would literally die just to hear him say, Daddy. And of course, your father did. He took bread and he broke it. God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself. He took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat. And in the same way he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. In the morning he would deliver up his spirit. That's the same spirit, the same spirit that then descends into you and returns to him as you say, Dad, Daddy, Father, So maybe this uh, should be our theme. The systematic exposition of St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, in other words, say daddy. You know, the more you say it, the more you say it, the more you will enjoy peddling and the more your everyday adventures will seem like a party, even a toga party. <laughs> Amen. And so in the name of Jesus, under the authority of his blood, listen to the word of God. You're forgiven. And it turns out that you weren't forgiven just now. You were forgiven at least 2,000 years ago. Not only that, you were forgiven from the foundation of the world. And I know you need his grace every day, but actually everything is grace because your father spoke it all into existence in the first place. If you don't believe it, well, life will feel like hell. And it'll just get worse and worse and worse until you do. And then you'll be home for the kingdom of heaven really is at hand. So in Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen. And that was the benediction, believe the gospel, by the way. But I also want to say, read the book of Romans, okay? So this is the, I mean, I'm thinking while we're singing these songs, we're doing this stuff, I'm going, picture yourself on the back of that two-seater bike. You're begging God, you're wrestling, you're struggling. God's pedaling the whole time. Um, but when you read the book of Romans, uh, read it like you're on the, the back of that bike. And you're going to get to some places where God is going to stress you out. Paul is going to stress you out, believe me. He, he will do that with everyone. And, and when he does, just say, uh... Dad? <laughs> Daddy? Help me. And we'll try to pedal, we'll try to pedal together. But he's with you and he's in you.
And uh, while we do that, I'll probably use uh, some commentaries, just so, so you know. Um, these are maybe ones that I'll refer to, and uh, you don't need to use these if you don't want. We'll probably talk about these, but just so you know, this is the word biblical commentary. This is a critical commentary. These things help you like with language, stuff like that. Uh, this is the Daily Bible Series by William Barclay. He believes many of the same theological things that I do, and he just has interesting insights. That's one. Uh, this is Romans by John Sott. He's kind of the classic evangelical, but he got in a lot of trouble because he said, I don't think God tortures everybody endlessly. Maybe he just burns them up. I'll probably we refer uh, to that one. And then, of course, I would recommend this one, Karl Barth's Epistle of the Romans, which really is maybe the most influential theological book that's, that's been written in the modern era. Um, so you might want to look at that one. Uh, I got this one by Douglas Campbell. haven't looked at it. It's just, you know, this is like the, the new stuff. But um, I hope that um, you would keep reading. And uh, let's see, I wanted to say one other thing. Oh, yeah, if you, if you can... Try to read, okay, from the ESV, English Standard, that's what we'll look at. The New King James Version, I think, is pretty good. New Revised Standard Version. And also the King James Version, because the old translators were afraid to change a few, a few things that the new ones did, which we'll, we'll talk about. And maybe best of all, if you can get access to an interlinear, and you can get those like on Bible Hub or whatever. And what they do is they'll take like a, a word, like the word pistis, which gets translated faith, and then they'll just translate it based on the most immediate and obvious translation. And you'll see there's a big debate around whether it's faith in Jesus or the faith of Jesus, and the interlinear will tell you, well, this is what you, you would just normally read it at first, and they go, okay, now why did the translator do that? But if you can, try to, try to do that. Next week is a Selah service, which is good, because that gives you time to read the book of Romans before we come back to it in uh, two weeks, and, and hopefully you'll just keep wrestling keep wrestling, keep wrestling, because the one that you're wrestling with wants to bless you. Um, it's Jesus. In his name, amen. Oh, and if you'd like prayer, I think members of our prayer team are gone, so I'll stay down front here this morning. If you want to pray with someone, you can come pray with me, okay? Have a great week.
Oh, oh, oh. 